Hi everybody, welcome to Enlightenment Today. It's Jason here. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the geography of mind. Now, what do I mean by the geography of mind? What I'm talking about is the evolution and the differences between the Eastern and the Western mind and how they're cognitively different, but we often assume that they're the same. Now, this is important, especially to understand other episodes in this series when, because I'll be talking mainly about Eastern philosophy and the mind of the East. And a lot of the problems that happen, especially when the Western mind begins to understand or try to understand Eastern philosophy is people step into woo-woo new age interpretations. So what do I mean by woo-woo new age interpretations? What I mean is the literal interpretations of mythological passages in the classical texts of the East. We see this a lot. This has happened back from maybe before the 1800s, but especially in the 1800s with the rise of theosophy and other forms of Western esoteric schools. Um, there has been an often the misinterpretation and the over-exaggeration of mythological passages. So in this series, we're going to get to the ground of the philosophy and the mind of the East and um, what that means and what it means to us in the modern modern day. Um, so to get into this, to, to understand the differences between the Eastern and, and Western psyche, we have to exclude one myth that has been promoted by science, promoted by, by a lot of psychologists, promoted by people in general, their way of thinking. And that is that there is one universal way of thinking. Now, when we look at it from the cognitive science perspective, this idea that there is one universal way of thinking is completely incorrect. Now, a lot of these ideas are promoted by certain uh, political scientists, such as Francis Fukuyama, uh, whose view on convergence um, is kind of an idea. His idea is the end of history. Okay, so the end of history means that capitalism and democracy have won over everything else. So he believes that the whole world is heading for convergence. And his idea is that the whole world is deep down Western, but we just don't know it yet. Now, a lot of people support this view, and this view obviously supports the idea that there is one universal way of thinking. But today I'm gonna expose that that's a myth and something that is not even supported in cognitive science, not even so much in psychology anymore, and it's definitely not the perspective of the East, okay? So to understand this more, we need to get a little bit of background to our foreground way of thinking. Now, what I mean by that is Westerners often when Westerners and even modern Easterners, when we look at or when we study Eastern philosophy, Eastern wisdom, we start to just have a look at the surface. You know, we see this with uh, modern yoga, where a lot of people think that just happy yoga is yoga. And that's only a very small part of yoga, which I'll explore in another episode. Um, this is just seeing the superficial foreground without understanding the background. So people think that they look at uh, the, the East and the mind of the East and we, we, we embody those ideas through our filters, our Western filters, and we think that we still look at it from our perspective. And usually it's often a Christian perspective or I should say a monarchical way of thinking, thinking of the universe as there's a Lord above the rest of it. Now that's completely um, excluded in Eastern philosophy. So um, to get background, to, to have a foreground without background, we can use an athlete as an analogy. Now most people love sport, right? So because they love sport, they look at the media and they look at all of the stories that, have, that are uh, promoted in the media that are told about famous athletes and all of their troubles with drugs, with women, with and men, and with um, you know their inconsistent form. And often people have the audacity to be to think that they can judge these professional athletes as if they know. Now, what we are excluding here is that most of us have never even lived a life of a professional athlete. So it's very difficult for us to examine and to say 
what we think and believe about what it's like to be a professional athlete because I have never been a professional athlete and most of you probably have not so it's kind of ridiculous for us to assume that we can you know pass judgment when we don't know a lot of the pressure and a lot of the all of that that goes on as a for a professional athlete so this is an analogy for understanding the east um, and the mind of the east and the philosophy of the east so you know what i always say to people people always you know a lot of people in the new age especially say oh you don't need to go to india or china or bangladesh or pakistan or thailand or nepal or these places because i could just read it in a book and I don't have to go anywhere. I'm enlightened right here and this and that. You hear a lot of these new age um, fallacies actually. And so just like with the athlete analogy, you know, it's better to go to know. This is what I, what I say to people. It's better to go to know. So to understand the mind of the East, it's better to go and see um, where the philosophy arose from, where the spirituality arose from, the mind of which it arose from. You could look at India, for an example, and you have a culture that is still alive from, you know, around 4,000 years ago and maybe longer. So how do you understand that? Well, you need to go and you need to embed yourself in that culture. And I don't just mean go for one week holiday. I mean to spend months there, maybe even years there to understand. If you're sincere, about Eastern philosophy and spirituality. Now, for, for you guys, I've, I've done all that for you. So, you know, we can watch these episodes and we can explore all this together. You could call me like your, your own um, personal uh, philosopher of the East. So that might be something um, that we can explore more together because I've done it. And, you, and in a sense, you don't have to go, but it's better to go to understand deeply, okay? Now, when we look at um, the, the Eastern and the Western view um, and the differences, um, there's one book that uh, is, is essential actually to gain a better understanding of this. And this is The, the, the Geography of Thought by Richard Nisbet. As you can see, there's a lot, of, a lot of gold in this book. I've extracted a lot from this before and I learned a lot. And this is um, essential reading if you're serious about understanding the mind of the East, what enlightenment means, what their philosophy is, and how that differs from the West. Okay, so this is important to understand. Um, now, some of the key things we need to sort of get into when we look at these differences is the perception, the difference, differences in perception and worldview. Um, of the East and the West and how that evolved. So I'll show you an image here. Now this is um, a bog fish, okay? So this is a big bog fish um, and amongst a lot of other fish, okay? So the question is, what do you see first? Do you see the bog fish or do you see the background? Um, now, be honest, what did you see first when you saw this image? Now. In, in, in the scientific research, um, when we look at the cognitive landscape of both the, the East and the West, we see that when they did this research, of, especially of this image and other images, is the West um, almost universally said, you know, they see the bog fish first, and there's nothing wrong with that. And then when they showed it to Eastern people, they almost universally said they saw the background in relation to the foreground. So they saw the background first. Now, what this research and this data com concludes is that um, the West dissect world in the ideas of categories and objects, while the East see the world in, in the sense of relationships and context. So, you know, to explain this a little bit better, we have a look at this other image. Now we look at this image and you have, um, the, uh, we have a cow, right? And so there's a cow and there's a chicken and there's grass. So which one would you say the chicken goes with? Oh, sorry, the cow goes with. Now, in the research that's done, a lot of people, Westerners, would say that it goes with the chicken and the Easterners would say with the grass. Now, why is that? Now, the reason why that is is because, again, 
animals, chicken, cow categories. Grass, cow eats grass relationships. This is how um, a lot of the research has come out. So, and this is also reflected into a lot of our philosophies and, and the differences in our philosophies. So especially when you look at Taoism, Chinese Taoism, Buddhism and Hinduism of India, um, there's a big emphasis on relationships and context as opposed to categories and objects. And that's also reflected into Western religions, the, the category and objects perspective. So, and we see this reflected into language actually. And I don't know how many of you have actually spent a lot of time in the East, but when we look at um, Eastern languages, when we look at, especially when we look at, say if we look at the Chinese language, for example, the Chinese language is very non-linear. And when we are in a conversation with a Chinese person, it's very roundabout. So to get to this point, we go all the way out here and then we come back to the, to the point of the conversation. Now, why that is, again, it's relationships and context, talking about everything in relation to what the point is and the context of the conversation. Whereas in the, in the West, as we know, um, language, especially English, is very linear and very straight to the point as I am with you right now. So, you know, we see this perspective in, in the language, we see this idea of categories and objects and relationships and context reflected into it. So, you know, the big question then is, you know, how did our perception and worldview evolve differently between Eastern and Western cultures? Now, so we have to look at the history. A good way to look at this is the history of ancient China and Greece. So when we look at ancient China and Greece, um, if we go back to um, 1500 BC to 2000 uh, BC, when we, when we look at that um, era of time and even, you know, after and before, um, as the world evolved, as people moved into Greece and as people moved into China, and as the environment dictated, our minds began to evolve differently. Now, what do I mean by that? So let's look at Greece. When we look at ancient Greece, we see that um, a lot of the population lived in smaller bands, smaller communities all along the Mediterranean. And the main source of food and the, and the main labor for food was uh, hunting, herding, and fishing. And so hunting, herding, and fishing, um, though they are good, sometimes can be good group tasks, they are usually only individual tasks. So as um, the Greek um, evolved, they, it, it was a very individualistic mind that evolved because of these certain tasks. Now, when we go over, especially into the, the, the Yellow River area of China, and we look at um, the civilization that was evolving there at that time, it was very big, it was a very big culture, many people living um, in close quarters with one another. Why? Because the main source of food was rice and um, cultivating rice. So what we had was we had a very collectivist mind begin to evolve because um, you know, we had to depend on each other and if you sort of had individual desires, um, egotistical desires, then that sort of didn't benefit the group because you know the main the main idea was just to survive back in that day and age. So cognitively, this had a big effect. Um, so there was a big difference between in the as a result from the environment and how that how it dictated the terms. In the West, it was very individualistic, and in the East, it was very uh, collectivist. Now, this means that as we evolved, we access different parts of our brain, okay? So, when we look at the human brain, as we evolved, um, there is, when we look at our cognitive science, there's two different aspects. There's a hot and a cold cognition. Now, I'll explain that in a little bit later, but as it evolved, um, in the West, because it was uh, individualistic, we used a lot more of the the, um, the, front, the frontal lobe of the brain. Um, so this is the prefrontal cortex here in the, in the, as part of the cere cerebral cortex in, in the frontal lobe region. And this is um, usually accessed when there's individual tasks and, and self-conscious tasks that need to be done. Um, collectivist tasks, we use, a lot, we use a lot of this part of the brain. Now, 
Now in relation to cognitive science, um, this prefrontal cortex is the cold cognitive part and the hot cognition is this all of this area back here. Some people identify it with the limbic system, um, but mainly the parts of the brain that people assume are unconscious. So what is the hot system? Well, the hot, uh, in, in psychology, they like, to, they like to make their own words up. So they have like for uh, hot cognition, it's either system one, uh, hot cognition. Um, and the hot system uh, is automatic, it's spontaneous, it's fast, it's effortless, and it's mostly unconscious, okay? So think of it this way. Um, the hot cognition is, you know, it's what, it, it's what makes me go like this. I can do this without having to think about it. When a beautiful person walks past you, mainly men, it's uh, mainly when a beautiful woman walks past a man, it makes their head turn around unconsciously. And it's also, when there's a beautiful, I shouldn't say beautiful, maybe an unhealthy sweet on the table, it's what makes us unconsciously go to grab that. And you know, that's also linked to the evolution of, our, of, our, of the human being, which is a whole different conversation. But it's what makes us go for that, okay? So um, in contrast to that, there's the, the cold cognitive state, which is in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, it, which is this part of the brain. And now this part is obvious, is uh, self-conscious, it's slow, it's uh, deliberate, and it's, um, that it's what, we, what we think of when we think of I. When I think of myself as Jason, I think of those cognitive control centers in the prefrontal cortex, which is the cold cognition. So the cold cognition can actually be a good thing because it's something that could say no to that sweet. But the problem in, in our world is we've over-identified with this part of the brain, with the cold cognitive state. So this can lead you know, to excessive um, individualism, to becoming egocentric, and to remembering that you're not part of the greater whole, um, which you know, is, is kind of a temperament that evolved in the West, not, not in a wrong way, but in a way that you know, we just overemphasize for that aspect coming from those earlier cultures, like Greece, for example. So, in understanding all that, um, when we look at all of that research, right, when we look at all of that, then we come to the conclusion that because um, in the West, they accessed a lot of this prefrontal cortex area um, as we evolved, that means the individual mind is more of the analytical mind. So that's why we see in the West, it's a very analytical culture. We only have to look at the economy, um, the way the social structures are set up, which actually the whole world is taking on now and the, and the East are taking it on even more. So when we look at the East, but the way the Eastern mind evolved and, and what a lot of people in the West don't understand is that it's naturally a holistic mind. So it always takes into account the big picture. Now, the, the reality is we need both because we have both parts of that brain. You know, the problem is, is we overemphasize and we overemploy the analytical mind, which causes a lot of trouble, a lot of problems actually. So, and the difference between that and the holistic mind is that the holistic mind is actually the natural mind because the sense of you separate or isolated from everything else is the greatest illusion that there is known to man. And, and the problem is, is the analytical mind and individualism continue to promote that. And that's one of the greatest injustices uh, to mankind at the moment. So as we see in the geography of mind, as we evolved, okay, is that the East learned to surrender the ego, to surrender their own personal desires for the greater good, um, for that which is bigger than them. Now you don't have to think of God or you don't have to think of any philosophy in that. In that case, they surrendered their own ego for, for the greater good of the community at that time. And then that got um, put into religions and philosophies and there is a beautiful thing about that. And there's a beautiful art to living about that when you become humble to that, when you start to surrender yourself to that which is greater than yourself. Whatever that may be, it could be your craft, it could be God to you. 
it could be even your family you know there is no one way to god as they say as a lot of religions say there's there is no logical interpretation which we'll get into in other episodes so the idea is especially when we look from a cognitive science perspective is that when we begin to downregulate this part of the brain then we begin to let the hot cognitive spontaneous functions of the universe come through and begin to um, expose the magic of life that there is begin to bring your creativity forward you know we only have to look at if we look at sport for example if we look at michael jordan why was he great he had the amazing ability to just get in the flow of the performance and he could and he was better than most and if we look at jonathan thurston in the national rugby league from the north queensland cowboys he's unmatched in the ability to be effortless in a game now i'll talk about a lot more about this in the episode of Zhuangzi. Um, which gets in the, the cognitive skill and relates to martial arts as well. So the idea is once we begin to downregulate, then you begin to bring, paradoxically, you begin to bring the real you forward. And, and so this key is, is to being humble to that which is greater than yourself, okay? Now, a lot of that is a lot to take in for one episode, and I know that, you know, <clears throat> we've got into a lot, but I implore you especially to look into the geography of thought by Richard Nisbet. It's a great book. And there's a lot of other good books on uh, cognitive science in relation to the Western um, and Eastern psyche, but Richard Nisbet's books are one of, the, one of the good ones to get into, okay? So thanks for being with me today. So guys, remember to continue to dive deep within yourself because a deep life is a good life.